Hello and welcome to the webinar. We're very happy to have you. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to talk about electric trucks today, which is one of my favorite topics, and I hope that you will get something out of this that you can apply to your business. Of course, we're happy to talk with you further at Sender uh, on how to implement these things in the real world. First, I want to do a bit of background setting, which is when we look at the uh, car market, this is the last five years of new registered cars in Europe. And you can see that between 2017, when 4.3% of cars had an, a battery and an electric drivetrain, and 2022, there has been more than a 40% increase in the number of new electric cars that have been registered. 12% of the newly registered cars in uh, 2022 were fully electric. Um, you can see that the 40% number also includes hybrids, it includes plug-in hybrids, and that 12% fully electric. This is a exponential uptake in this new technology. Of course, that means when we look at the other side of the equation, which is diesel and gasoline it, cars, we can see that they have gone from a 94% market share in 2017 down to only a 53% market share in 2022. So that's the flip side of the equation that the old technologies are getting phased out. And when we put these two graphs together, we can clearly see that the future of vehicles is going in one direction, and that is in the direction of electrification. Probably 2023 might be the first year that we cross this line. If it's not 2023, it's going to be 2024. That is a really fantastic um, indicator of what is to come. We believe that electric trucks are about three to five years behind passenger vehicles on this exponential uptake curve. And probably in 2025, we will see something like 50,000 to 80,000 electric trucks enter the roads in the EU. A lot of that is driven by the uh, OEM CO2 regulation uh, for the vehicles that need to be sold. So part of that is uh, from the technology front, and part of that is from the regulation front. We really believe that this is right around the corner. So let's take a quick check-in on how do electric engines work? Well, here's our beautiful animation of a truck with a drivetrain, an electric drivetrain. And what you can see here is you can actually see three electromagnets. And what happens is that a electric motor has a three-phase electric current. And what that essentially is doing is that it's pulling a magnet around and around in a phased uh, electricity um, uh, pull. And that is actually what turns the wheel and why the motor is directly connected to the wheels and the axle uh, in an electric truck, where that is not the case in a diesel truck. And when we look at uh, what is a common question about hydrogen versus battery electric, I think there's something that's very interesting and worth clarifying here. This is a uh, diagram from uh, the United States Department of Energy. And here on the left-hand side, you see a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, what they call an all-electric vehicle or a battery electric vehicle. And you can see that in both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, there is what is labeled as an electric traction motor. And the electric traction motor is exactly what we just saw here in this diagram. That exists in both the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle and the all-electric battery vehicle. It is the same type of propulsion system in both of these vehicles. The difference between hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric is how we are storing the energy that you, is used to power that electric motor. So in a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, there's hydrogen that's being stored in a tank, and that is then converted into electricity through the fuel cell stack, and then that's used to power the electric motor. Um, on the right-hand side, you see that there's basically uh, the base of the vehicle is batteries, and then those batteries go to directly power the motor in the electric traction motor. There is a big difference, though, between the overall efficiency of hydrogen and direct electrification or battery electrical vehicles. Battery electric vehicles, which you see on the left-hand side of this diagram, turn about 80% of the input power into traction. And that means only 20% of the total input electricity or energy is lost. For hydrogen, it's a very different process. So for hydrogen, you're essentially taking water, you're adding electricity, and you're turning that water into, water is H 
H2O, you turn in that H2O into H2 and O2, and you're splitting apart the hydrogen and the oxygen. That process to get the hydrogen from the water has quite significant energy losses. So that's the first step in creating the hydrogen. And then after that, you fuel the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle with the hydrogen you've just created, and then you turn that hydrogen back into electricity. And the downside of this process is that about 60% or more of the total power is wasted from the beginning of the process to the end of the process. And this is something to keep in mind. Of course, nobody knows what the final uh, composition of zero emissions vehicles will be, and maybe it will be different in, in different sectors, but we view this as an indication, um, one indication among several that battery electric vehicles may have a long-term economic advantage, uh, especially in a world where there is re limited renewable electricity power generation um, that really pushes towards this direct electrification system via battery electric vehicles. But of course, we'll all see how it rolls out over the next 10 to 20 years as we go through this transition. Now, here's a beautiful diagram from the New York Times recently. And this answers the question for, uh, for cars that are currently in, in production. And of course, uh, we're looking at emissions per mile since this is a US diagram. Um, but of course, it applies exactly the same to uh, kilometers. And on the top, you see electric vehicles. This is all the different electric vehicle models that are available in the US when this diagram was made in 2022. And on the bottom, you see what they call gas vehicles. Uh, they actually mean gasoline uh, vehicles that are on the bottom. And uh, the bubble size is the size of the vehicle. Remember, these are all personal vehicles, not trucks. And what we can see is that there's a 40 to 90% reduction in emissions when we're using uh, electric cars versus gasoline cars. And what's really interesting is that this was actually asking the question, okay, well, what about these big pickup trucks, for example, the Ford F-150 Lightning versus the Ford F-150, which is also a pickup truck, a gasoline-powered pickup truck? Is it really better to do battery electric in such a big truck? There's so many batteries. Well, if we look purely at emissions, we're seeing about a 50% reduction in emissions between the Ford F-150 in its gasoline version versus the Ford F-150 Lightning um, in its electric version. So even in probably the not so friendly, uh, maximum elect, uh, environmentally friendly version uh, of, of a big pickup truck with a lot, a lot of batteries, um, you're still gonna save about 50% of emissions in this circumstance. And you can also see what's interesting is that the biggest personal vehicles that are electric are emitting about the same as the absolute smallest gasoline power vehicles. So this is a fundamental shift in the uh, amount of carbon reductions that are uh, that are happening from cars on a per kilometer or per mile basis. We are also seeing exactly this trend when it comes to trucks. So speaking of trucks, when we compare the emissions of trucks, the electric trucks, to the emissions of diesel-powered trucks, we can see that depending on the country and the average electricity mix in each of those countries, we're going to save, on average in the EU, 63% of emissions. That is very good because that means we can run about two transports or three transports for the same amount of uh, emissions that we would run one diesel transport. Now, that's just on average. If we look at countries between Netherlands, Germany, we're sort of in the 40, 50% range, going all the way up to Austria and France, where we're at the 85 to 95% uh, range of emissions reductions. This is a really good step already. And this is also taking into account a pretty conservative truck electricity usage. As you'll see a little bit later on, um, this is using 1.4 kilowatt hours per kilometer. We believe that this number will improve drastically over the next couple of years. Um, and so we'll see these emissions reductions actually going even higher. There's another factor here that's really important. So you probably noticed that Poland at the bottom is actually increasing emissions by 10%. If we plug in our electric truck to the Polish grid at this moment in time, 2022, we'll actually increase emissions by 10%. But that, of course, has the caveat that that's from grid electricity. The main, 
sort of key advantage to electric trucks is that if we have solar panels on our roof or there's solar panels at a distribution center at the warehouse, we can run those same trucks on 100% renewable electricity and go to zero emissions. So that's a game changer because there is, there's no world in which uh, most carriers or logistics operators are going to be able to produce their own renewable diesel or their own diesel. That is not true for electric trucks. So that's a fundamental game changer where we can actually reduce emissions and also reduce costs by producing our own electricity in this cycle. So that's a fundamental game changer. That means we can get to zero emissions with trucks um, already today using 100% renewable electricity. So let's look at electric truck operations and see what can we really expect from electric trucks here today. So we are viewing this in sort of a three phase stages, let's say, of electric truck implementation. The first is where you have a closed loop between A and B. And in that closed loop, you are looking at just one charging per loop or less. That's a very simple setup because all you need is one truck, one charger, and a closed loop between A and B. That is already a very good option for many, many customers today, especially because a lot of those closed loops that are uh, of this nature are very high volume lanes. That helps us increase the utilization of the truck, which then decreases the cost premium between electric and diesel operations. So this is a really nice area to focus. I'm talking about 2023, 2024. This is a really, really great area to focus on electrifying uh, heavy duty road freight. Phase two is also implementable today. It does get more complicated. So what we're talking about is going to closer to the maximum range of a truck. We might say 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers, something like this. And we would be using two chargers to do a full round trip. Now the round trip is still going to be a closed circuit between A and B, going back and forth, A, B, A, B. With the second charger, the complexity of operations goes up quite a bit um, because we're now beyond the maximum range of the truck being able to return to its home base uh, without, without charging again. So if something goes wrong with charger number two, we need to make sure, for example, we have a backup charger so that that truck can get home. We don't wanna leave a truck stranded. So that's where the complexity on this phase two gets a little bit higher and it needs even more due diligence than doing the phase one, but this is still absolutely possible to do today. And the, um, the electric loads that Sender has done to, de to date um, are actually all in this phase two category. So we can confirm that this is possible, but it does take a lot of due diligence and making sure that there's um, good backup charging options to make sure your truck can get home. And then phase three. So phase three is really where we think the, um, the discussion on electric trucks is worth um, matching the technology that's available today to uh, realistic expectations. Sometimes you might hear, okay, well, electric trucks, they're, you know, they're not going to have the range, they're not going to be able to compete with diesel, et cetera. Of course, that is not the case that electric trucks can just do free floating operations, which is often the case for what diesel trucks are doing. Yet. And we believe that, that the earliest scenario where that's going to happen is 2026, but it might even be later in the decade. And that would probably be just on some corridors where there's really high density of loads and of chargers where operators can feel safe running a truck, picking up loads, and knowing that they're going to be able to operate that truck um, in a profitable way. So that's definitely for the future. It's good to also keep in mind that a lot of the flows that exist in Europe are actually already phase one and phase two. So we can probably already electrify a significant number of the total loads um, in these phase one and phase two operations, knowing that phase three is something we're gonna save for the future. When that happens, it will be time to, time to launch on that. So when we look at the scalability of, uh, of all these technologies, um, we looked at a problems analysis. And we looked at four different potential problems that would impact the scalability of various technologies. So we looked at equipment investment. Do I need to buy a new truck? Second is fleet production capacity issues. Are there enough of those trucks being produced if I want to buy 50 of them or 100 of them? Three is fuel production capacity. Is there enough fuel being produced to actually run those trucks in the way I expect? And four, do I need to build new uh, fuel stations? Is there fuel station investment required? And because we're looking at a problems analysis, 
No is a good answer. That means no problem. Yes, there is a problem. That's a bad thing. And then the percentages you see here are the expected carbon reductions we would get versus diesel. And so when we look at all four of these, you probably will see some familiar fuel types on here. You might see HVO, for example, which is a renewable diesel that we do a lot of work with in almost every country in Europe. You can see that that is plug and play into existing diesel vehicles. No need to buy a new truck. There's a lot of diesel trucks available, so that's no problem. It gets a 90% reduction in emissions, as you see here in the percentage. Um, there's a lot of it being produced, so there's no supply capacity issues, and it works in existing diesel pumps. So that's really a plug and play solution when it comes to HVO. B100 biodiesel is a different fuel type, which requires small changes to motors in order to be able to run. But besides that, it's also plug and play with existing um, infrastructure. Now, what we see happening today is that electric is moving from the yes, it's a problem to the no, it's not a problem in two key categories. One is fleet production capacity. Electric truck production is ramping up. We saw at the beginning the number of new cars that are registered every year in Europe is fundamentally changing towards electric. That same thing is happening now for trucks. And we are starting to see that move into the no problem category. On the fuel station investment, we're also seeing that that is moving into the no problem category. It's not completely solved yet by any means, but there's something on the order of magnitude of 250,000 electric chargers in Europe. That is far, far ahead of, for example, hydrogen, which has around 100 fueling stations for hydrogen. So we're about a thousand times um, further ahead uh, for electric charging compared to hydrogen fueling, for example. And we believe that this is going to move solidly into the no problem category over the next couple of years. So what that means is as we look into the very, very near future, I'm talking end of 2023 through beginning of 2025, electric is moving solidly into the no problem category. Of course, with the caveat that we still need to buy a new truck. So there is a bit of um, extra due diligence that's needed there to get those trucks on the road. If we want to make sure that we're using those expensive uh, assets well, let's talk about battery expectations and engine efficiency, because these are two crucial aspects of electric trucking to understand. The first thing on the battery expectation side is that 20% of the, the label battery capacity is not usable. It's the difference between the, the gross battery capacity and the net battery capacity. And um, it's the first thing to understand about batteries in trucks. The second is that there's a 20% approximately uh, battery degradation that's expected for the first one to five years of the vehicle. And then it levels out after, after this 20% uh, degradation period. And this is exactly the same as you experience on your iPhone. When you look at your iPhone, if you go into settings, you're gonna see, okay, battery capacity is probably 93% or 87%, whatever it is. The exact same thing happens for the lithium ion batteries in trucks and also in electric cars. So that is totally expected. It also means we need to keep it in consideration as we're planning for our loads. There's an additional probably five to 7% loss of uh, battery efficiency in winter, and that's due to cold weather. Most batteries have a warming system around them, which uses, of course, electricity to keep them warm. Um, but it also uh, mitigates a bit of the cold weather effect on the battery. So there is a slight efficiency loss in winter, which we need to keep in mind. And then, of course, a 10% energy reserve, because what we don't want to happen is we get to our destination with 0% energy left, and then we can't go anywhere from there. So we need to have a bit of a buffer in our planning. And so what that means is we've got somewhere around 50 to 55% of the rated capacity in planable capacity. Um, and then engine efficiency. So the true engine efficiency of diesel is very, very well known. We can tell you uh, which our carriers are doing what uh, in terms of uh, fuel efficiency. And um, you know, when you log into a transport management system or a vehicle management system, you can often see directly exactly the fuel efficiency of each individual truck um, throughout its history. So that's a very well known quantity that is not true for electric. And you can see that the real world tests range from basically one kilowatt hour per kilometer all the way up to two kilowatt hours per kilometer. 
And that is a very big range. We're gonna provide some color on this in just a second, but it is really important to keep in mind because if you said for your diesel truck, okay, it might be 25 uh, liters per 100 kilometers, or it might be 50 liters per 100 kilometers, your cost basis would be very different. Um, so it's something to keep in mind that how crucial energy efficiency is. So when we look at battery capacity in the real world, this is using the, um, the Scania Regional Bev, which is just uh, coming to the market right now. Um, the total battery capacity is 624 kilowatt hours. And as I mentioned before, 20% of the battery is not usable. It's the difference between the uh, gross matter, uh, battery capacity and the net battery capacity. So that brings us down to about 500 kilowatt hours. 500 kilowatt hours minus another 20%, 25%, let's say, uh, for the battery degradation and the winter losses means that we have a realistic battery capacity of 374 kilowatt hours minus a 10% reserve that gets us to 337 kilowatt hours. What does that mean? What's a kilowatt hour? How far is that going to get me? Let's look at that. Well, um, if we look at the three different trucks I have here, which are the Scania Regional Bev, the Volvo FH, which is also available electric, and the DAF CF, you can see their total battery capacity in kilowatt hours. And then the range that it would be stated when you say, okay, I'm going to just read the label, what do the manufacturers say? Um, and I want to reinforce that these are true numbers. They, they're absolutely achievable. Just the difference between what you see on the label and what you would actually want to plan for in your daily operations, there's going to be some variance there. So, if we compare the battery capacity to low efficiency uh, engine use, which would be 1.7 kilowatt hours per kilometer, you can see that the Scania truck, for example, would have a real planable range of 198 kilometers. That would be keeping 10% in reserve upon, re upon arrival, which is a good practice. Medium efficiency for the Scania truck would be 225 kilometers. And then high efficiency, we're taking as 1.1 uh, kilowatt hours per kilometer, would get us to 306 kilometers. And you can see, of course, this varies by, by truck. So we view the planable range as somewhere between the 1.1 and the 1.5. And as we get more data on this, we're going to be able to um, be more precise in our projections. At, also, it matters on terrain. Are we going uphill? Are we going downhill? Um, have we done driver training, for example? Driver training for electric, as you see here, might be even more critical than it is for diesel because it's an enabler, a yes-no type situation. So when we're applying this to different lanes, and I've taken three examples here. One is a shuttle lane that would be 50 kilometers long. One is the lane from Rotterdam to Antwerp, which is 110 kilometers. And another lane from Antwerp to Dusseldorf, which is 195 kilometers. And let's look at what, what would be possible. This is the number of one-way trips that would be possible per charge. Now, if you take the shuttle lane, for example, you can see that, okay, if we're doing low efficiency, all the trucks would be able to go there and back on a single charge. That's two one-way trips would be there and back. Three actually doesn't help us very much because that would mean we go there and back and there again. But depending on where the charger is, if, we're, if we have charging at A, getting back to B doesn't actually help us. So we would actually need to charge after the second one-way trip. But if we're operating at medium efficiency and we're using the Scania Regional Bev, for example, we would go here, there, here, there, and back again, which means that we could still use our one charger located at A. And you see something similar in the high efficiency uh, where we can do six one-ways, um, meaning we could operate this entire lane with just a single charger. If we apply the same logic to the Rotterdam to Antwerp, you can see that um, there's two trucks with high efficiency that would be able to actually go round trip on this 110 kilometer using the planable range that we've stated up above. Um, that would be the Volvo FH and the Scania Regional Bev. Um, the Scania Regional Bev having the additional slight advantage that it has a slightly extra bigger battery capacity, meaning we can get to uh, a full round trip, even if we're not operating super efficiently. And then you can see with the longer range trip, you either need to have high efficiency on a truck like the Volvo, or you need to have a slightly bigger battery like the Scania uh, to be able to do one way on just a single charge. So the point of this is that uh, you need to take into account 
the battery. You need to take into account uh, the vehicle capabilities, including the engine efficiency, and also exactly where your charging is going to be, because all of that needs to come together for smooth operations. Lastly, battery size is an enabler, but it's not the only factor. Um, electric trucks are part of a system, and that system needs to work together. It means charging at the right speed, it means charging at the right place, the right time, and operations, et cetera. When we summarize all of that, we can see that there's a couple different factors for success. So one is lane selection, making sure it's the right set of flows, and two is the hardware selection. So first, predetermined route parameters. It's very important to understand what are the uh, operating times of all of the facilities, what are the operating times of the chargers you're going to be using, um, et cetera, understanding all of the route parameters that are going into the flows. Second is predictable volumes. Electric vehicles at this point are not going to be suitable um, for the highly seasonal flows. For example, it's probably not a good idea to sign a four to five year commitment for uh, ice cream deliveries, which are happening only you know four to six months of the year. Um, thirdly, is high vehicle util utilization helps the economics of electric vehicles. So um, having very high volume flows makes it much easier to allocate those flows to one truck and allocate them um, in a consistent way. And that will help bring the cost uh, premium down between electric and diesel to, I would say, within striking distance of diesel. Um, and lastly, electricity price. It does matter um, because there it can be up to a 30% uh, of the OPEX when we're looking at uh, diesel. And it can also be that case for electric. So it's very important to uh, know where your electricity is coming from and making sure to source that in the right place as part of this planning process. If it's possible to get, for example, industrial electricity prices um, on, a, uh, on a, a proprietary charger, that can really lower those electricity costs from, let's say, public charging, which might be 65 cents per kilowatt hour, down to if it's really industrial, um, industrial electricity prices can be somewhere around five cents per kilowatt hour. So you could reduce like 90% of the price of your electricity um, if you do that planning correctly. And then lastly is hardware selection, matching the right truck, as we saw in the previous slides, to the specific routes um, and making sure that the charging capabilities are lined up with the lane selection on the left, as well as the hardware selection for the truck on the right. There's a couple things that are making us very optimistic about the future of electric trucks, battery electric trucks, and these are exponential trends. So one of them is that battery density is increasing about 11% per year. What that means is that the same amount of kilograms of battery will hold twice as much electricity six years from now as it does today. We saw that the planable range, let's say, of the Scania with uh, high efficiency operations is about 300 kilometers. So if we take a realistic 300 kilometers today, and we know that that's going to double in five to six years, that means the vehicle we're going to have in five to six years from now is going to have a range around six to 700 kilometers versus 300 plus a little bit today. The second thing is that the battery costs are dropping about 15% every year. What that means is that we have five, every five years, the batteries we're buying today are gonna to cost, cost half as much. So our 300 uh, kilometer range vehicle that costs maybe three to four times what a diesel vehicle costs today, in five years will cost maybe only 1.8 or two times what a vehicle diesel vehicle costs um, with twice as much range. And that's where we start to get these fundamental economic changes that are in favor of battery electric versus diesel. Fortunately, as I mentioned before, going to the uh, not a problem category, um, we have charging stations in Europe are um, increasing in number by about 35% every year, which means they double about every two to two and a half years. And global EV production is increasing 55% every year for the last several years, which means that the number of EVs produced is basically doubling every one and a half years. So this is really game-changing fundamental um, exponential trends in favor of battery electric and is what makes us very optimistic on their future. Um, here you can see uh, one of our first electric trucks, and uh, we're very happy to have this launched. 
uh, this is a very nice moment for us. And uh, when you hear the truck, you actually hear that it's practically silent. The wind was uh, actually um, actually louder than the truck itself. And then one last thought is green is a strategic advantage. So when we talk about shifting from diesel to other types of fuels, advanced fuels and electric trucks, it's really fundamentally changing the transportation that we're offering. And maybe I share some thoughts with you here. So um, if we look on the top, we have diesel operations. And what that means is basically pickup, we've got the transport, some driving, and then we have a delivery. And of course, on-time delivery. That is mostly the extent of diesel operations. If we look at what we at Sender call HVO Direct, this is HVO reduces emissions, as I mentioned before, by 90% compared to fossil diesel. Um, of course, the operations get a little bit more complicated. The reason for that is that we need to uh, fuel the HVO, and then we need to make sure that the HVO is fueled uh, with uh, proof of fueling. And so the operations for an HVO Direct load look like pickup, some driving, uh, fueling HVO, delivery, and then, of course, our uh, driver has to submit proof of fueling for the correct number of liters. That's now a five a five stage process instead of a three stage process. And for HVO Flex, which is our um, second HVO product, which uh, sender gets to decide which truck does the fueling instead of uh, fueling directly in the truck that does your operations. Um, we have pickup, transport, and delivery on truck one. And then on truck two, we have the HVO fueling and the proof of fueling uh, from the second truck. So that's also a five-stage operation, same amount of carbon reductions, um, but of course, slightly more complex. Now, if we apply the same logic to electric, what do we have? Well, on diesel, we have still pickup, transport, delivery. If we have electric operations for the short haul, which is, let's call it in the phase one zone that we saw up above, We've got pickup, we've got the transport up to maybe 150 kilometers. We've got probably shorter than that. Delivery, return to origin because we're on a closed A to B loop. And then we've got charging. And then we've got another pickup because we're doing closed loop. So that means we're fully responsible for the truck from pickup to delivery back to origin, including charging, and then the next pickup. And so that is a closed loop operation, which then has more components to it than. Uh, diesel operations. And then when we're talking about medium haul, which is sort of this uh, 300 kilometer maximum transport, we see that, okay, well, we've got pickup, then we've got some driving, then we've got charging, then we've got delivery, then we've got return to origin, then we have charging again, and then we have pickup again for the next load. So you can see that the complexity of these operations is increased versus let's say business as usual transports in the heavy duty transport industry, which relies solely on diesel. And this is actually why we believe that mastering green operations gives companies a strategic advantage over their competition. That includes Sender. We believe that this is a strategic advantage for us because we are able to master these more complex things than the traditional um, way of operating. It's also true for our customers because our customers, are then aware of how these operations are taking place. It allows shippers to master those operations and their management. And especially when we look at electric trucks, there is a lot that nobody knows yet. And so we believe that the knowledge creation on this exponential uptake will probably be concentrated among a small, smaller number of companies. Um, and those companies will be able to reap the benefits of this new technology that is going to be having a very big uptake over the next three to five to 10 years, just like we saw with the exponential uptake of electric personal vehicles in Europe. We're going to see that same uptake for electric trucks over the short and medium term. So uh, this is a picture of our most recent uh, electric truck, just to show you that it is uh, truly happening. This was from about two weeks ago, and um, we're very happy to be doing that. So I'd like to close on that. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the ride. It's been a pleasure to welcome you to our webinar. If you would like to learn more about electric trucks, about uh, green transports, or you'd like to connect with Sender in general, I would be happy to uh, receive your email. You can see my email here at the bottom of the slide. It's graham.major.x at sender.com. And we are looking forward to 
decarbonizing this industry together with you. Thank you for joining the webinar today, and I'll look forward to hearing from you soon.